you. Can you guys speak, um, and you guys have touched on it a little earlier, what are the best practices for using primary sources and doing this work? And I shall say also, um, Dr. Professor Alridge, if you also want to kind of speak to this as well, by all means. Well, I assume that when, when you're saying best practices, that one thing is it has to be something that the students can actually have access to and that they mm -hmm. are able to read and understand. I mean, you're not going to give uh, uh, something to uh, third graders that they can't read. But to the extent that you can uh, engage students in original source material mm -hmm. uh, rather than textbooks, the extent, and, and, and I've seen this done uh, in the Oakland Public Schools, uh, and I was surprised, frankly, that, that, that in my experience with my own kids, I had three different, you know, three kids go through the same high school. One of them had a very different education from the other two. He was in all the APs and everything. Everything he got was original source material. My other two kids got textbooks. So, uh, you, you, need to, you need to have uh, uh, some preparation done by you as the teachers in, uh, in some cases of selecting summaries or other ways of uh, 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 original source material. And your, the UVA uh, website, by the way, is a fantastic example of that, of giving kids access to things like court arguments or, or uh, uh, different information that it that they can that they can use in their arguments where they're not just relying on on a paragraph in a textbook. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I would well actually, Dr. Alvarez, did you want to did you want to uh, uh, say something on that? I'll, I'll just say something really quickly. Um, we're going to talk about this uh, some in the workshop today. You know, um, oral history and storytelling is becoming. Has become, uh, the big thing now uh, mm -hmm. in, in higher education, but also in, in K through 12 education. And I think um, oral history provides um, students an opportunity to not be bystanders of history, but rather to create their own original source material and to create primary sources. Yeah. And one thing that um, I would encourage um, you all to do is have uh, students interview their parents and grandparents about their life experiences and then integrate those interviews, material from the interviews into their projects. And that's one thing that um, I've been doing in my um, graduate and undergraduate courses. Exactly. Yeah, the, the, the oral history, and, and that's something that's so accessible, right? I mean, because you can, even if people weren't eyewitnesses, you can interview them about their memories, about the legacies and when, what they heard and the stories that were passed down. So that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, great, that's a great approach. Um, and and I, would, I would only add about primary sources that, you know, when thinking about in the context of these challenging um, topics and, you know, that, that we have to teach, whether it's, um, you know, slavery or, or racial terrorism or what have you, uh, lynching and the like, um, as an African-American, as a person of color teaching at Ohio State University, uh, which is not just predominantly white, it's overwhelmingly white, right? They, they like to pretend that it's a little bit more diverse, but uh, let's be real about what's happening at Ohio State. Um, and I, I pull students not only from urban you know, centers and, and, and suburban centers, but you know, rural Ohio and the like. And so I realized that if I wanna talk about sort of the founders, if I wanna talk about the Confederacy, if I wanna talk about you know, Ronald Reagan, right? that I have to get the students, I tell the students, you, know, you don't have to listen to me, listen to the sources, listen to the primary sources, right? Listen to Thomas Jefferson, UVA, in his own words and notes on the state of Virginia, right? You don't gotta take my words for it. Here you go, this is my man right here. You wouldn't shut up, right here you go. <laughs> um, and so that actually becomes so important, right? Because I think that Dr. Ducci, it gets to what you were saying. It's like, oh, you're not trying to adopt. No, I'm not trying to, I didn't say that, right? He said that, right? You want to believe what you know succession was all about, right? Then look at the you know the convention records for for the or the records for the succession convention. So I think primary sources are not just uh, are are essential for creating that um, the the tools for you know critical analysis, but it also can be used as a way to diffuse 
you know, what students are, you know, the, 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 the biases, right, that they're projecting onto you, right, and say, no, no, no. I mean, so, so for some of my classes, especially so U.S. history, like, I'm not even, like, I don't say anything for the first couple of weeks, right, <laughs> in, in a way. I'm just like, look, this is all sources, right? Let's look through the sources. We're going to use this. And then we get to a point where further, further enough along where the students start asking questions, you know, of me, Right, like I did, rather than you know, the first they start asking questions of the sources, then they begin to ask the questions of me because now they're like, oh my goodness, and I point them to other sources. So I think the sources and thinking about how to teach these subjects as well. Sometimes it's like, nah, I didn't say it. You know, this is what they said, and the the sources become the focus of the discussion, which is where I think it should be as well. Yes.